Arirang Prime. In the mid 16th century, a new form of schools called sawans appeared in Korea. Most of them sat some distance away from villages, tucked away in beautiful, natural surroundings. Just like in the past, the road to a sawan is a long one. With nothing to rely on except one's two feet, it even begins to feel like taking a trip away from everyday life. Sawans still stand where they used to be 500 years ago. What kind of wisdom did Koreans hope to gain at these institutions? Lend an ear to the messages that Sawans are trying to get across to all of us here in the 21st century. Schools have existed throughout all of history and in every single culture. Now here at the Sawan, it served as a private university during the Joseon era. Now you may wonder if I had been born during that time period, would I have been given admission to a school like this? And the answer to that question is probably not. Spots at these schools were reserved for the children of nobility, and not just anyone. It was reserved for the cream of the crop. So who were these individuals that were admitted to these schools, and what exactly did they study? Let's dial back the hands of time and visit the Joseon era to understand what Soans are all about. Many Soans, including the very first, were boarding schools. Studies began the moment the students opened their eyes in the morning. A Sawan's emphasis was not on the mere transfer of knowledge, but on putting that knowledge into practice. So the students had to begin their day the moment they woke up, with no time to be idle. The pursuit of congruence between knowledge and lifestyle, that was why students had to board even tidying up their surroundings and keeping themselves clean were all part of education. At the center of Sawan education is Kanghak, a learning procedure that encouraged students to find answers through discussions among themselves and with their teachers based on what they'd learned through independent studies. In the Joseon dynasty, a state examination called Kwago was held to appoint government officials. Most students at a Sawan had already passed the first level of these exams, which meant that education at a Sawan had to be very in depth. Most of the students were Sunbis, scholars who were part of Joseon's ruling class, and a large portion of them were members of the Sarim faction, who did not take government posts and were based in regions. An educational activity just as important as Kanghak was Chehyang, or ceremonial rites. Through these rites, Sawans paid their respects to their role models and stayed committed to keeping their teachings alive. <laughs> 
ja. Taeyang rites were held twice a month on the first and fifteenth days, and they were scaled up every spring and autumn with a huge turnout of Sarim scholars in the region. By participating in these regular ceremonies, Sawan students grew up to become members of their academic community. Sawans were comprehensive institutions offering well-rounded education. They also had what one would call libraries today, which were run under a set of very strict rules. For example, three teachers, including the director, had to be present to open the facility. Teaching materials used in Sawans included the essential four books of Confucianism, as well as books on the role model of each institution. Because the printing techniques of those times were far from advanced, Books were invaluable assets and treated with great care. The students could not have been more serious about their studies, for they saw learning not as a means to an end, but as an ongoing endeavor to discover their true nature. This is the reason why Sawans placed great importance on Yushik. <laughs> Given their austere self-discipline and the ceaseless demand to utilize their knowledge, the students were constantly under pressure. This called for various Yushik activities to help them unwind. Through these leisurely activities, the students sought to become one with nature, the embodiment of the laws of the universe. Kunajan 어느 곳에 피었는고 석양에 홀로 서 있어 갈곳 몰라 하노라 The students had a fervent passion for learning. 대학 지도는 제 명명덕 하며 They questioned themselves repeatedly. Why were they studying? What roles would they play in their society and country based on what they were learning at the Sohwon? Hundreds of years have passed since then, but Sohwons still serve as a place of learning. Students from a university of education who will be teaching at elementary schools in the future set out to get some hands-on experience at these traditional educational institutions. This is Dozan Sawan, built to honor the spirit of Twege Yi Huang and keep his teachings alive. The university students first pay their respect in front of the ancestral tablet for Yi Huang. The Cheyang rituals are an integral part of their Sawan experience. During the Joseon period, Sawan served as schools where talented students came to study Neo Confucianism. But here's something interesting each and every Sawan had a religious shrine to honor Confucian scholars. Then this brings about some interesting questions. Why did the schools have religious facilities? 
Who were these individuals, and why were they enshrined there? When Yi sung founded Joseon in 1392, the kingdom was completely different from Goryeo, which had been dominated by Buddhism. The literati who founded Joseon together with Yi sung chose Neo-Confucianism as the state ideology. They set up government bodies, laws, and systems based on this ideology and were appointed as government officials to implement them. Running the country by the Neo-Confucian order required a pool of talent, so the government established Sangyunguan, the top elite school in the nation. Sangyunguan would have been equivalent to modern-day state universities. Admission was granted only to those who had passed the first hurdles of the state examination, or were from families that rendered distinguished services to the country. The cap on admission was around 100, and most students lived in the Sawan dormitories under strict regulations. Sangyunguan was at the center of Joseon's national education. Meanwhile, education in the regions was handled by academies called Hyangyo, which accepted not just the aristocrats, but also the common people. However, from the mid Joseon era, Hyangyo started to lose its foothold as an educational institution. When public education in the regions became useless, the need for a new type of school became apparent. Fortunately, many scholars who were based in the regions had great academic achievements and soon began to lead a movement for a new kind of school called Sawan. Among them, a scholar named Chu Se Bung had a unique view on education. He believed that it was education that made human beings what they were, and that education was the best way to overcome social chaos. The school that he established when he became the governor of the Pungi County was Sosu Sawon, the first Sawon in Korea. Although it was the first of its kind, Sosu Sawon embodied the basic architectural style that all Sawons display. The Kangak building where academic studies were held was at the front, with a shrine for the Sawon's role model built on the left and the dormitory built on the right. It is said that over the course of 350 years, Sosu Sawon produced some 4,000 individuals of talent. The institution's role model was scholar An Hyang, who first introduced Neo-Confucianism in Korea. Sosu Sawon was established in the region of his birthplace. As the first Sawon ever, Sosu Sawon does not display certain building arrangements that characterized later academies. The student's dormitory was right next to the faculty room where the teachers resided. And it's notable that the stereo baits of the dormitory and the faculty room were different in height as an expression of the hierarchy within the institution. The pavilion where the students' yushik activities took place was located outside the Sawan. Here, the students would have composed poems, talked about their studies, and regained peace in their minds.
nestled cozily between a body of water and a mountain. Sosu Sowon later emerged as a venue for the gathering of the region's scholars and as a key institution in the community. Sosu Sowon in the autumn of 2013. It's the day of Chuhyangje, a ritual that has been passed for some 470 years. Every spring and fall, Sowans hold rites to honor the great sages they enshrine as their role models. These are the descendants of those who studied at Sosu Sowan over the course of 470 years. In Korea, the followers of Confucianism are called Yurim. They stood at the center of regional politics, and their influence remains far-reaching. The ritual begins with the preparation of an alcoholic beverage. Although they no longer brew it themselves, their heart is still there. Rituals held to honor role models were a core part of Sawan education. Ancestral rites in Korea are quite different from religious rites. They are an expression of the determination to remember and emulate the person being honored. Confucians in particular held their teachers in high regard, likening them to the king or their fathers. Their fathers may have given them life, but it was their teachers who nurtured their spirit and identity. So Su Sawan's role model is An Hyang, the scholar who first introduced Neo Confucianism in Korea. It was the norm in the Joseon era for educational institutions, including Sawans, to choose respectable individuals as role models and hold rituals to honor them. Sanggyunguan, Joseon's top state educational institution, also held such rituals twice every month and on a bigger scale twice every year. History shows that ceremonies served as a language for the ruling class. Through these strictly guided rites, Joseon scholars sought to strengthen their moral authority and establish a hierarchical order. Sung Kyung Kwan's role model is none other than Confucius, the father of Confucianism. However, because Joseon's state ideology was Neo-Confucianism, its role models included not only Confucius, but also prominent scholars who contributed to the growth of Neo-Confucianism, including the 18 prominent Korean Confucian scholars. Among those 18 scholars, 14 were from the Joseon dynasty. In fact, many from Joseon's early years were symbols of integrity and loyalty. Some even faced political oppression and were exiled or killed. What was the reason for this? Yuha 
그, 이 갈등을 했던 그 사림들, 그 사림들이 이 높이 평가 되기 시작한 거죠. 그래서 그분들이 그 저리를 지키고 그 진리대로 삶을 살았던 그 내용이 이제 나중에 각광받게 된 것입니다. Located in Hamyanggun of Gyeongsangnam-do is the grave of Cheong Yeo Chang, who was executed at the king's order for adhering to his principles. As part of his punishment, his corpse was exhumed and beheaded again. Cheong Yeo Chang is well known as the master of Neo-Confucianism in the early Joseon era. He fell victim to political retaliation while trying to lead a life based on the truth he gleaned from Neo-Confucianism. And it was to honor his spirit that Namge Sohwon was built. Among the Sohwons still standing in Korea, Namge Sohwon was the second to be built after Sosu Sohwon. It was from this institution that the typical layout of Joseon Sawans began to manifest itself. The Kangak building was surrounded by the shrine at the back and the pavilion used for Yushik activities in the front. This layout became the basis for the establishment of all Sawans. Cheong Yeo Chang's disciples created a special landmark where their teacher could be praised forever. It was a pond filled with the lotus flowers he had loved so much. As can be seen, every Sohwon has a symbolic space that is related to its role model. There is another Joseon intellect known for his integrity. He is Kim In Hu, a Neo-Confucian scholar who represented the Honam region in the Joseon era. To this day, he is extolled by the people in the region for his erudition and unbreakable spirit. When his bright and benevolent king suddenly passed away at the age of 30, Kim In Hu felt that fortune had abandoned the nation. He came to this place on the anniversary of the king's death every year to mourn the loss. The layout of Piram Sohwon, which honors Kim In Hu, is different. The dormitory, which should have been in front of the Kangdang, was built behind it. When one enters Piram Sohwon, the first thing that can be seen is the back wall of the Kangdang, the Sohwon central building. It was designed to face the innermost building which is the shrine commemorating the Sohwon's role model. Kim in Hu was highly revered and emulated, not just by his disciples who established the Sohwon, but also by the local people. Perhaps this is the reason why all the buildings inside the Sohwon are facing his shrine. Kim In-hu is a testament to the high expectations that Joseon scholars placed on the character and erudition of their leaders. In a neighborhood completely surrounded by mountains, sits the head residence of Yi eun -chuk, another prominent Neo-Confucian scholar of the Joseon dynasty. His studies were passed down to Twege Yi Huang, who completed the foundation of Joseon's Neo-Confucianism. The architecture of this house, which served as Yi eun -juk's refuge, shows how committed he was to his studies. Inside the house, the view is blocked by maze-like walls. When Yi eun -juk lost his post by standing up to the authorities, he returned to his hometown and built a very closed house to show that he was open to nature, but closed off to the world.
and he lived in complete seclusion, not as a way to escape reality, but to make preparations for the future through meditation and studies. Near Yi Anjok's head residence is Oksan Sawan, which honors him as its role model. The valley that runs in front of the Sawan is famous in the region for its spectacular scenery. However, inside the Sawan, it's difficult to find a space that offers a glimpse of this beautiful landscape. This seems to be the Sawan's tacit instruction to its students to focus only on their studies and self-discipline. A bird's eye view of this Hoan instantly reveals its closed off layout. It was in this environment that Eon Juk's disciples devoted themselves to their studies and continued to build the world of Neo Confucianism. And their studies bore fruit in the form of publications. Serving as publishing houses and libraries, Hoans played the role of regional cultural centers. In the case of Oksan Sawan, some 4,000 volumes of 860 pieces of work have been passed on. Scholars who wish to transform Jozen society with Neo-Confucian ideals faced an incredible uphill political battle, especially during the early days of the Jozen dynasty. But they never lost hope. They remained steadfast in their desire to transform society into a utopia where everyone could live in perfect harmony. And about halfway through the Joseon dynasty, they finally got their chance. They emerged as the central figures in certain political circles because nobility was expected to engage in such activities. Now behind it all were the academic and moral achievements of Yi Huang, who's responsible with founding Joseon era Neo-Confucianism. Yi Huang was the greatest scholar of the time who not only promoted the establishment of Soans, but also persuaded the government to provide funding to help them achieve financial independence. He was loved by not only the literati, but also the kings of Joseon. Although he received countless offers of public office, he declined them 20 times and settled down in his hometown well into his 50s. And it was here that he built a small school called Tosan Sodang. Yi Huang was actually largely responsible for promoting and building the Soan during the Joseon dynasty. Now I'm here at the Dosan Sodang, which actually is a school that he designed, he built, and actually taught students in during his life. But on the hill behind me is the Dosan Soan and it was built about four years after his death. But as a building so iconic, it actually found its way onto the back of the Thousand Won Bill a few years ago. But in many ways, the Dosan Sodan can be thought as the precursor to the Dosan Sowan. And it's also said that this shabby building epitomizes his educational philosophy. But it's something that I just don't see. But what exactly is Yi Huang's academic philosophy? Yi Wang wasn't a fundamentalist tied down by ideologies. While obeying the rule of having only three compartments in the house, he added a veranda to add more space. Also inside, he installed partitions to overcome spatial limits. It is said that he had some 1,000 books in this single bookcase. His main interest lay in searching for a philosophical explanation for the nature of humankind. However, Tosan Sodan, which he designed himself, is filled with a sense of freedom based on pragmatism. Several talented individuals gathered around Yi Huang, eager to learn from this prominent scholar who pursued ideals while being exceedingly practical at the same time. Kojiksa was a building where those who cooked students' meals and managed the buildings resided. 
Its size, larger than the main building, hints at Tozan Sadang's far-reaching influence at the time. The ideas of Yi Huang, who opened up new horizons in Neo-Confucianism, are just as valid today. Harvard 너무나 그 신기해서 왜 퇴계를 공부하느냐라고 했더니 어, 그 친구들 한 이야기가 오늘날 기계 문명, 오늘날 이 산업 문명이 갖고 있는 어떤 물질적인 폐해 이것을 극복할 수 있는 대안은 동양 문명 속에서 어, 찾을 수밖에 없고 그 가장 적합한 모델이 자기네들은 어, 퇴계로 생각한다 그렇게 이야기를 했습니다. 말하자면 잃어버린 인간 또 인간의 도덕성에 대한 굳건한 믿음 이런 것이 퇴계 정신 속에는 들어가 있거든요. 그 점을 그분들이 높이 산 것이다. Yi Huang wrote the history not only of Korea's Neo-Confucianism, but also of Korea's Sawans. In 1576, six years after Yi Huang's death, his disciples built Tosan Sawan right behind Tosan Sadang in order to keep alive and spread Yi Huang's teachings. It was a wise decision that not only ensured the preservation of Yi Huang's Tosan Sadang, but also portrayed the hierarchical relationship between the Sadang and the Sawan. The heart of Tosan Sawan was this shrine, for the educational function was already being fulfilled by the existing Sadang. What was meaningful was the establishment of the Sawan itself. The space to the right of the Kangdang was left empty, so that the shrine at the back would not be concealed. Originally, this space was for the office of the Sawan's director. The ideological value of Yi Huang continues to this day, some 400 years later. This was possible due to the students who studied at Tosan Sawan. In this dormitory, they celebrated the spirit of their teacher and internalized his teachings. And Tosan Sawan thus continued to grow for the next 400 years. This was the repository of Yi Huang's thoughts. After Yi Huang's time, schools of thought with academic roots sprung forth. To promote the academic world of Yi Huang, Tozan Sawan also made many efforts to publish his collection of works. It used these wood blocks for publication. Because these blocks could be reused to print books anytime, they were valued more than the books themselves. Since Yi Huang's time, Chosun scholars armed with elaborate theories rose to the forefront of history. Meanwhile, Sawans continued to fulfill multiple roles, serving as an incubator of scholars, a cradle of knowledge, and a place that instilled the Neo-Confucian order in the residents. And one Sawan was a perfect architectural embodiment of Chosun's fully-fledged discourse on Neo-Confucianism. It's home to a 400-year-old ginkgo tree that was named after Kim Kweng Pil, a prominent Neo-Confucian scholar in the early years of Chosun. The practical principles that he valued the most came from a book called Sohak. Sohak uh, 어, 주로 좀 어린 사람들한테 많이 가르치는 책인데요. 
이 아주 그 생활 예절입니다. 물 뿌리고 청소하고 인사하고 뭐 이런 것에서부터 친구 사귀기, 부모에게 효도하기, 어른 공경하기 등등의 그런 실천 예절인데 왜 그것이 강조되었느냐 하면 그 고려 시대 때 불교는 그런 실천 예절보다는 심오한 철학을 추구하느라고 그 사회를 버리고 절로 들어가는 그런 그 분위기였는데요. 그것이 폐단이 너무 크다 보니까 이제 그것을 극복하기 위해서 실천 철학을 강조하는 그런 분위기가 된 거죠. The spirit of Kim Gwangpil blossomed 60 years after his death in the shape of Todong Sawon. Todong Sawon is said to be the best textbook example of Sawon architecture with all its elements. A view of Todong Sawon from below reveals a vertical axis. Another axis exists inside its building. It is a horizontal axis that divides the building into two equal parts. The buildings built on slopes were erected on stone platforms to level them horizontally, and the height was covered by stone stairs. Even the sculptures show perfect symmetry. All buildings of Todong Sawan are placed evenly along a linear central axis. This is an accurate manifestation of order in Neo-Confucianism. And at the end point of the central axis stands the shrine with Kim Gwang Pil's ancestral tablet. This meticulous arrangement does not mean that Todong Sawan is bound to monotony. The flower wall, a sturdy combination of stones both large and small, is just one example of the beauty that can be found at the Sawan. The top of Hwanju Moon's roof was adorned with antifixes, which stand out against the solemn-looking buildings. Much effort was put into Hwanju Moon, which permitted freedom in its details. Todong Sawan maintains a subtle balance through this combination of rigid tension and freedom. And the stereo bait of Chung Jung Dang is a fine example of this juxtaposition. The seemingly casual artistry is a delightful touch. Of course, the most astounding finesse of Todong Sawan can be found in nature itself. To secure a breathtaking view, the Sawan even chose to face north, which was not a common practice. From the mid Joseon era, Neo Confucianism became ingrained in the lives of the common people. This is how Korean men express that they are getting married. Up until the early years of the Joseon era, men who married a rich woman often became a member of her family. But that practice disappeared after the mid Joseon era. In the last half of the Joseon dynasty, all women were required to live with their husband's family. This heralded the establishment of the so-called first son first principle. The inheritance of property also became focused on sons, particularly the eldest son. Whereas in the past, any inheritance was shared equally among children, regardless of gender. This led to the rise of a first son-centered clan society. 
the influence of Neo-Confucianism soon reached the areas of norms and customs. And in the academic sense, it was Kim Chang-seng who completed this school of thought. From the end of the 16th century to the early 17th century, Chosun weathered two large wars, while technical developments in agriculture resulted in a drastic population increase. Society became complex, which in turn led to the development of yehak, or the study of proper behavior and decorum. Kim Jang Seng's yehak spirit has been engraved on the wall. Sa il hua pung, treat others like the cloud with positive energy and the gentle wind. Pak mun yag ne, expand your knowledge and be proper in your actions. Ji bu he ham, embrace everything just as the earth supports all things and the ocean accepts all water. The value of proprieties lies in encouraging individuals to fulfill their roles in order to create a harmonious society. Kim Jang Seng's Yehak set forth a national vision for Joseon, which at the time was going through a transition. Taeinmyeon offers a scenic view of a peaceful farming village. But something looks out of place. There's a sawan right in the middle of a village, not nestled in nature. This atypical site is attributed to Che Chi Wan, the father of Confucianism in Korea, who was appointed as the head of this region some 1,100 years ago. The villagers had already built a shrine to honor his virtues a long time ago. However, with the arrival of the Sewon boom in the mid Joseon era, they built a Sewon where the shrine used to be. It was Musong Sewon. Once inside, one cannot see any other buildings except Myeongyundang, where learning took place, and Tezhansa, the Sewon Shrine. This layout emphasized the Sewon's significance as a place for conducting Cheyang. In fact, it placed more emphasis on establishing rapport with the villagers than on the scholars' self-discipline. Kohyun Hyangyak, created under the leadership of Musong Sewon scholars, was an agreement made by villagers to abide by the ethical principles of Confucianism. Musong Sewon's tendency to encourage the involvement of its community led to the rise of the army led by Che Yi Kyun in 1906. In 1905, the Ulsa Nugyak was created. Benam Che Yi Kyun was able to do it in other places, but it was not a bad thing. But in 1906, the Ulsa Nugyak the Sunbi spirit entailed laying down one's life for the nation. And it was up to the Sohan to cultivate the Sunbi spirit of putting knowledge into practice. Chosun Sawans played a pivotal role by serving as schools that fostered the elite, a forum for establishing public opinions, 
a repository of knowledge, a place of reform for villagers, and a regional cultural center. In particular, it was where scholars were engrossed in self-discipline, dreaming of the day they would become a kunja, a man of noble character who is morally complete. Thanks to advances in modern science, we actually live a life much more affluent than those who lived so many years ago. And we've come to embrace the many conveniences and comforts of modern life. But when you think about it, it really hasn't helped us answer the timeless questions that have plagued mankind throughout the ages. Who am I? What's my purpose? Do my actions have any consequences? Now, from a modern perspective, we live a life in a secular and materialistic world. The chosen scholars led a life that was filled with intense dedication and commitment to life at the Solon. How was it that they were able to live a life with such conviction? The answer to that actually lies within the walls of the Solon. It would be impossible to talk of today's academics without mentioning the advancement of modern science in the West. Its analysis of the natural phenomena greatly expanded our realm of knowledge. However, scientific advances could not solve all the problems of the human race. Nowadays, the need for integration and convergence has resurfaced as a measure to overcome the limits of the fragmented knowledge of mankind. Although people today enjoy innumerable benefits of the high-tech industry, they are still clueless about life in so many ways. Architecture is said to be a vessel of any given time period and a manifestation of the human spirit. What is the spirit embodied in Pyeongsan Seowon? The first building that greets one inside the Seowon is Manderu, which offers an unhampered view of the surroundings. Here the students would have freed themselves from all pressure and become one with nature. However, such functions do not have much meaning for the architecture of Pyeongsan Seowon as a whole. Manderu was much more valuable as a link between the Seowon and nature. In fact, Another place inside this Hoan presented a truly stunning view. It was none other than the Kangdang, which stands right in the middle of this Hoan. Let's try sitting in the director's seat in the main hall and enjoy the view. It's as if one is looking at a seven-piece folding screen with Manderu's columns serving as the frame. Seowon이라는 게 이제 성리학의 전당인데요. 이 성리학은 철저하게 인간 중심의 자연, 인간 중심의 사회, 우주 이런 걸 이제 생각을 했고요. 그때 말하는 인간은 이제 그 열심히 공부해서 이 깨달음을 얻은 인간을 얘기하는 거죠. 소위 군자의 반열에 오른 분들을 얘기하는 건데 어 그렇기 때문에 이분들은 늘 이제 그 어떤 중심에 있게 되고요. 그 자연의 이제 그 중심에 자기가 위치한다라고 봤고 건축이라고 하는 것은 단지 이제 그 인간과 그 자연을 매개해 주는 마치 그 액자 같은 거 이런 생각을 하게 됐습니다. In Neo-Confucianism it was believed that human beings were given a set of rules that were universally valid and that it was through the process of learning that they could realize them. In a sense, Neo-Confucianism may be a synonym for anthropology. No matter how stunning a natural landscape may be, at its center is mankind. In the end, Seowans are vessels of Neo-Confucianism, the school of thought that placed mankind at the center of all. The idea that society has reached its peak is nothing new. The environment is on a downward spiral, 
And the notion that material wealth can bring long-lasting happiness just simply isn't true. By stark contrast, the Josen scholars opted to live a life of poverty and move away from wealth. They spent their time at a solon studying the answers to life's questions. What is man's nature? What are the fundamental components of life? And what's the relationship between man, nature, and the universe? Through their deliberations, these scholars found that the universe, nature, society, man, are all interrelated. They put man at its center. And they lived their lives with such conviction that they seem to be asking me a question. A man like any other on the face of the earth. Are you truly happy?